Hi, my name is Nima Sarani, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center. I am also the assistant director of the Ultrasound Fellowship Program and the assistant director of clinical operations for sepsis care. In this presentation, I'm going to briefly talk about the role of MDW biomarker in the emergency department through a patient case study. So I'll start by talking about the sepsis burden and its diagnostic challenges, then talk about monocyte distribution with or MDW and its utility in the acute care setting through a patient case. As you all know, sepsis is a deadly condition. It has 15 to 30% mortality rate and responsible for 30 to 50% of all in-hospital deaths. It represents over 10% of all ICU admissions. Sepsis is also very expensive. In fact, it is the most expensive condition in modern medicine. In the United States hospitals, sepsis was responsible for nearly $24 billion in annual costs. Overall, we understand that the earlier we treat sepsis, the better the outcomes. The table on the left demonstrates delays to antibiotic administration and septic shock is associated with increased mortality. In fact, over the first six hours after the onset of recurrent or persistent hypotension, each hour of delay in initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy was associated with mean decrease in survival of 7.6%. As demonstrated on the figure to the right, early initiation of antibiotics for sepsis in general is important and not just sepsis with hypotension. Here, the mortality risk, which is expressed as adjusted odds ratio of death, increases with increasing delays in initiation of effective antimicrobial therapy. So early treatment is important, but first we should have the diagnosis or at least suspect sepsis before targeting our treatment. Unfortunately, as providers often experience, the diagnosis of sepsis is difficult as most septic patients present with vague symptoms that are often missed, leading to worse outcomes. This study looked at septic shock cases by SEP1 definitions and coded diagnosis over a two-year period at an urban academic hospital. Overall, it demonstrated that most, about 63% of all patients with sepsis, septic shock presented with vague as opposed to explicit symptoms. Their definition of explicit symptoms were those symptoms that would immediately lead the clinician to consider infections such as fever, chills, productive cough, and dysuria. Their definition of vague symptoms was if the symptoms did not include any of the explicit symptoms, which would make infection less apparent. For example, fatigue, weakness, abdominal pain without fever. When the ED provider suspected sepsis, they triggered a sepsis flag. As expected and demonstrated here, the sepsis trigger was fired more frequently when the patient's symptoms were explicit as opposed to vague. More patients presenting with vague symptoms did not receive their appropriate antibiotics. Also, the in-hospital mortality rate was higher among the patients presenting with vague symptoms. So we have a deadly condition in which early treatment is key, but diagnosis is very challenging as most patients with this deadly condition present with vague symptoms. This is where monocyte distribution with can help us. Monocytes in their inactivated form exist in fairly similar sizes and therefore their distribution width is narrow. In the face of a pathogen such as bacteria or viruses, the monocytes are activated, which depending on the severity of infection create a large variability in their volumes. This causes an increase in their distribution width and MDW goes up. MEW has been studied extensively over the last five years, and as a result, we are starting to have a lot of data on it. This study in particular led to FDA clearance of MDW for detection of severe infection and sepsis in the emergency department. It included 2,158 patients in three large EDs in the United States. The receiver operator characteristics curve or rock curve demonstrated the value of MEW's, MEW's diagnostic performance. As the area under the curve increases, the more valuable the diagnostic marker in detection of sepsis. Tests with AUC values greater than 0.8 are considered very good diagnostic tests. Here, MVW alone had an AUC of 0.79, which is already pretty good at diagnosing sepsis. But once MVW was combined with an elevated WBC, the AUC increased to 0.85. The box and whisker plot on the right demonstrates yet another valuable characteristic of MDW. It shows that MEW increases with progression of infection severity. So more severe infections, such as septic shock, will have higher MDW values. So MDW can be very helpful in detection of sepsis and its severity. Also, MEW is easily accessible, 
since it can be available as part of your CBC with diff. As you can see in this study, a complete blood count or CBC is the most frequent blood test ordered during an ED visit. 85% of all blood tests ordered in the ED is a CBC. MBW will simply show up in your routine CBC with differential. As you can see here, MBW is within the differential here, and it's down here at 24.6. With that said, let's talk about a patient case where we can demonstrate MBW's utility in the acute care setting. You work in a busy shift in the emergency department, 9.30 in the morning, you have a patient that arrives to the ED. This is a 63-year-old male with a history of coronary artery disease, diabetes, and lung cancer, who presents to the ED complaining of generalized body aches, fatigue, and, and weakness, which started about one week ago. You ask him some additional questions and he denies localized weakness or numbness, um, he's mostly general, generalized weakness and fatigue. He denies chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, denies headache or urinary symptoms, and his last chemotherapy was about a month ago. He's feeling more tired than usual. He also has history of anemia and thrombocytopenia. So the chief complaint is basically fatigue and generalized weakness. At 9.35, you have your initial vital signs. His temperature is 37.1, blood pressure 122 over 73, pulse is 88, respiratory rate is mildly elevated at 21, and his SpO2 is basically normal, 97% on room air. His positive physical exam findings include mildly dry mucous membranes. Considering that he has history of thrombocytopenia and is generally weak, he does have history of anemia, you actually go ahead and during your physical exam, you perform a rectal exam, so his hemocol test is positive uh, for possibility of blood in his stool. At 1040, you have your CBC with diff that comes back. And it shows mild elevation in white count, which is 12.3, but it also shows some anemia with a hemoglobin of 8.2 and thrombocytopenia with platelet count of 100,000. Now we know that this patient has history of anemia and thrombocytopenia, but when you compare his anemia to his previous lab value, uh, which was done about two months ago, you notice that there's a decrease from 9.1 to 8.2. At the same time, we have MDW that comes back and it's elevated at 27.3. Understanding the value of MDW in suggesting underlying infection in the acute care setting, the providers here go ahead and order additional labs at 1045. They place in lactate and blood culture orders. Considering this patient has immunocompromised state with chemotherapy, history of cancer, additional comorbidities, they actually pull the trigger and go ahead and order antibiotics as well. At 1050, they go back and do a head to toe exam on the patient. They noted that there's elevation MEW, also white counts elevated as well, and the combination is suggestive of an underlying infection. They went back and revalued the patient to make sure they're not missing anything. So at 1050, they did a head to toe exam, which revealed mild erythema and induration around the porta cath. At 1105, CMP came back and that was normal. At 1115, antibiotics were given. 11.27, lactic came back and was elevated at 3.2. 11.33, chest x-ray came back and it was normal. At 12.55, urine also came back and that was normal. Considering the clinical picture, the uh, clinicians go ahead and admit the patient to the hospital. Blood cultures eventually come back days later and it shows gram-positive cocci in clusters. So, 10.40 during the ED visit, we have CBC with differential that returns. Along with that, we have access to MEW, and MEW comes back, and that's elevated at 27.3. Considering that elevation to MEW is suggestive of an underlying infection and understanding its value in the acute care setting, the providers go ahead and they consider sepsis, and that makes them order additional um, stuff, including lactate, blood cultures, and they go ahead and order antibiotics. They go back, look for a sign of a, a source of infection, do a head-to-toe exam, which reveals possible port infection. At that time, we have SIRS met. Uh, recall that the patient's respiratory rate was mildly elevated. The Y count is also elevated, greater than 12, so it's 12.3. Um, based on our exam, we have possibility of infection, um, likely a port site infection. So based on that, by SEP1 definitions, we have sepsis. And SEP1 definitions are still the definitions that CMS goes by. Antibiotics were given in 1115. At 11.27, lactic comes back and it's elevated at 3.2. Once again, based on SEP1 definitions, lactic greater than two, less than four on somebody that has sepsis. 
is determine time zero for severe sepsis. So 1127, we have time zero of severe sepsis. Patient was eventually admitted, blood cultures days later comes back, gram positive coccyne clusters. Initial vital signs were obtained at 935. 1040 in the ED, we have CBC that came back, showed anemia as well with a hemoglobin 8.2. Recall that that was a decrease from our previous hemoglobin a couple of months ago, so it's gone down from 9.1 to 8.2. Now, uh, clinicians also performed a physical exam initially, and it demonstrated hemocol positive stools. So acute on chronic anemia, plus hemocol positive stools in a patient that presents to the emergency department for generalized weakness and fatigue, also has history of thrombocytopenia, is very much suggestive of a GI bleeding. So could that have resulted in transfusing the patient a packed unit of RBC and called it quits at that point, admitted the patient in the hospital, in which case we would have missed their underlying infection. This is a patient that eventually had blood cultures that came back positive days later. Not only that, we would have missed all our metrics. Now, having access to MDW and noticing that it came back elevated, and that happened exactly at the same time, it made the providers to consider sepsis. That allowed them to place in additional orders, lactate blood cultures um, and repeat lactate, and antibiotics were given at 11.15. Now, going this route, which was caused based on access to MDW and understanding its value allowed us to administer antibiotics to a patient that had an underlying severe infection, had a port side infection, and had blood cultures that came back positive. Not only that, it allowed us to meet all our metrics. So to summarize, at 9.30, we have a patient that comes to the emergency department. At 9.35, we have vital signs that showed a mild elevation in respiratory rate. Physical exam was also performed around the same time, which showed hemocol positive stools. At 10.40, we had CBC that came back, which showed anemia and thrombocytopenia. At 10.45, providers went back to the head-to-toe exam, revealed port site infection. Antibiotics were given 11.55 and 11.27. Time zero was determined uh, because that marked the time when the, lactic, when the lactic acid came back and it was elevated. So commonly, path A occurs where we see this patient, we have CBC with diff without having access to MDW noticing that the patient has acute on chronic anemia, hemocol positive stool, presenting with symptoms that suggest underlying anemia. And in this scenario, providers would go ahead and transfuse the patient, admit the patient to the hospital and call it, call that, that this patient has acute on chronic anemia due to a GI bleed. However, had that happened, we would have missed an underlying infection. So having access to MBW allowed our providers to consider a alternative path, which included considering sepsis, ordering additional labs, which include lactate blood cultures, but importantly, starting antibiotics, which is a cornerstone to sepsis treatment. Patient received antibiotics 1115, eventually admitted to the hospital, blood cultures came back positive, but they were already treated for their underlying infection. We can always argue, had we not had access to MDW and not have uh, been concerned about an underlying infection, this patient would have gone admitted somebody who has blood cultures that's positive for bacteria, the likely would have gotten worse in the next few days until finally someone would have um, figured out that there's likely an underlying infection going on. And by then, it might have been too late. So just to summarize here, um, MEW is the only proprietary FDA-cleared hematological biomarker exclusive to Beckman-Coulter analyzers that helps to aid in identifying adult patients with risk of severe infection or sepsis in the emergency department. It also reduces diagnostic uncertainty. MEW helps clinicians in escalating or de-escalating care in patients with suspected infectious etiology. Also, MEW is available early in patient assessment as a part of a CBC with differential tests. Now, the question is, how can you include MDW within your uh, CBC? Um, I guess first you gotta figure out um, who runs your CBC in your hospital. Um, MBW is just part of the differential, but if you don't have the right analyzer, unfortunately, you wouldn't have access to MBW. Uh, for more information about MBW and how to access it, please visit uh, Beckman Coulter's website. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention.